the faithful men and women of Scripture live their lives in the light of eternity. You know, Enoch believed God, that God was the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Joseph was not captivated by the lavish wealth of Egypt because heaven was on his mind. Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, and he forsook the treasures of Egypt because scripture says he looked for the eternal reward. Daniel was not awed by the glittering gold of Babylon. He wasn't awed by the lavish temple dedicated to the god Bel Marduk with its golden throne and golden table. Why? Because he was looking at a god that sits on a heavenly throne. Xerxes, the king of Persia, did not charm Esther with his wealth. Why not? Because her allegiance was to the king of kings. And certainly, the apostle Paul was not intimidated by the glory of Rome because he had looked into the face of God and saw the glory of God. You see, every one of these faithful men and women of Christ, from Enoch to Abraham to Joseph and Moses and Daniel and Esther and Paul, every single one of them live their lives on earth in the light of eternity. Now, the secular godless rulers of the day lived as if there were no tomorrow. The pleasures of the moment stimulated their senses and captivated their thoughts. Think about it. You've got Belshazzar and Xerxes and Alexander and Herod and Nero. What did they live for? They lived for one thing, the present moment of now. Now, the classic example of a life of one living in the light of eternity is the Apostle Paul. Now, if on your deathbed, you can look back as Paul looked back on, this, on his life, you would have lived a successful life. I'd like you to take your Bible and look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is in prison in Rome. Death is near and the end of his life is certain. And he speaks to a young man called Timothy, writes him a letter, asks Tychicus to bring that letter to Timothy quite quickly. Second Timothy chapter four, we begin with verse six. Here are the final words of the apostle Paul. It's really his valedictorian address. Second Timothy chapter four, verse six. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to those who've loved his appearing. Now notice what gave Paul such courage. What gave him such courage? undying faith. Paul lived not simply for today, but for tomorrow. Paul lived his life in the light of eternity. Now let's notice this verse phrase by phrase. Verse 6, Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. What does he mean by that? I'm being poured out as a drink offering. He's contrasting his death with a pagan practice. And the pagan practice was at the end of a meal, the pagans would take a glass of wine and they would pour out that glass of wine as a drink offering to the pagan gods. So the apostle Paul states, my entire life was poured out in sacrificial service and loving ministry, 
not as a sacrifice to some senseless idol, but to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Paul's talking about the fact that he did not live life for today. He lived life for tomorrow. He's talking about the fact that he did not live a self-centered life focused on pleasing himself, but a life of ministry. Paul lived his life in the light of eternity. Now, when Paul declares there in that sixth verse, the time of my departure is at hand. It's an interesting phrase in the original language. The time of my departure is at hand. You know what it says literally? I'm pulling up my stakes. It's like you've been camping and you have been camping in this tent and it's time to go home. So what do you do? You pull up the stakes. You get ready to make a departure. What is Paul saying? He said, I'm getting ready to go home. I've been living in this earthly tent, this frail human body, but, but this is not my permanent home. I'm pulling up the stakes. You see, for the apostle Paul, death was not to be feared. It was rather the pulling up the stakes from this world and embarking on a journey for eternity at the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Paul lived his life in the light of eternity. He did not allow the things of this world to choke him. He did not allow the things of this world to strangle his joy. He did not allow the things of this world to so occupy his attention that he forgot the purpose of life. He was living for eternity. Then Paul makes three remarkable statements in verse 7. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Let's look at each of them. First, he says, I've fought the, the what kind of fight? I fought the good fight. Anybody that thinks that the Christian life is a walk down easy street will soon have a rude awakening. It's a battle with evil forces. It's a struggle with the hosts of evil. It's a fight with satanic powers. There's a fascinating statement in a book called Ministry of Healing, page 453, that really helps us to understand this 2 Timothy 4, 6, I fought the good fight. It says this, this is Ministry of Healing 453, the Christian life, read it with me please, the Christian life is a battle and a march. In this warfare, there is no release. The effort must be continuous and persevering. It is by unceasing endeavor that we maintain the victory over the temptations of Satan. Christian integrity must be sought with resistless energy and maintained with a resolute thickness of purpose. Now notice the language, a resistless energy, a resolute thickness of purpose. There are some people that think, oh, when I become a Christian, Everything is going to be wonderful. It's going to be like floating on a cloud. No problems, no difficulties, no challenges at all. But in the Christian life, there may be internal struggles. There may be overpowering temptations. There may be financial reverses. There may be unexpected accidents. There may be personal conflicts. There may be sickness at times. There may be pain, suffering, emotional hurt, but here is the overwhelming joy. Christ has not promised that there will be no struggles. He has promised that he'll be with us in the struggle. He's promised that he'll never leave us. He's promised that he'll never forsake us. Look, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5. There are some people that have this idea. If I go through a struggle in the Christian life, I must be off the map. If I go through emotional difficulty, at times if I'm discouraged, something must be wrong with me. If I, if I face temptations, if there's some accident that happens that changes my life, what did I do wrong? There are people that have that idea. What I say to you today, Paul says, I will fight the good fight. That no matter what happens in my life, no matter what difficulties there are, the more, what challenges there are, I am not gonna give up because by the grace of Christ, 
He is going to be with me. He is going to get me through this. There's somebody today, you're going through some challenge. Somebody today, you're going through some difficulty. Somebody today, you're walking through some valley. Somebody today, there's some mountain you have to climb. Here's the good news. Don't give up. Christ is going to get you through this. Because he says, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, what are we going to say? Boldly or confidently, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. The Lord is my what? Is my helper. Or consider what Paul says at the end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. He's just faced a trial by Nero. His body is racked with pain. He's facing death by the executioner's sword. He says, verse 17, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me going through trials of life, going through difficulties, going through challenges. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me. In other words, what Paul is saying is this. God has an eternal purpose for my life. And nobody can keep that eternal purpose for happening. When I go through trials and difficulties, when the Christian life is a battle and a march, God has an eternal purpose for my life. God has an eternal purpose for your life. And nobody or nothing can keep that eternal purpose from being fulfilled. It says here, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Paul says, I fought the good fight. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Why is it that Paul had such confidence in God? Why could Paul go through shipwreck? Why could he go through beatings? Why could he go through the traversing the desert sands and surviving went thrown into the sea? Why? Because he lived life in the light of of eternity. He lived life, li life, asking God to preserve him for indeed his heavenly kingdom. We fight the good fight of faith, not in our strength, but in his. Now, Paul makes three statements. First, he says, I fought a good fight. Secondly, he says, I finished the race. You know, it's one thing to begin this race in what we call the Christian life. It's another thing to finish it. Now, people drop out of the church for different reasons. Some people drop out because of a conflict with another member. They can't handle it. I don't want to see that person. There's a problem. Some people feel that they can't live up to God's standards. Standards are too high, so they drop out. Some people get caught up in some heresy, some doctrinal deception. They drop out. But Paul says, I have finished the race. Paul knew what it was like to be ridiculed, mocked, and scorned. He knew what it was like to be stoned and shipwrecked and beaten. He knew what it was like to be treated unjustly, tried unfairly. But he says, I've finished the race. And I say to you today, do not let anyone or anything destroy your faith. Don't let anyone or anything discourage you separate you from the bride of Christ, his church. There is strength in Jesus for every trial. There is grace in Jesus for every failure. There is forgiveness in Jesus for every sin. There is hope for every broken relationship. Eternity is at stake. Eternity is at stake. Do not allow anything or anyone to separate you from Jesus or separate you from his church. Live your life in the light of eternity. Paul says, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the race. Then he says, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, I have kept 
the faith. In other words, I've not compromised. I've not sold out my loyalty for Christ for the things of this world. The trinkets of this world, the cheap imitation pleasure of this world, has not captivated my attention. I've not compromised. I've not sold out my loyalty for Christ for the things of the world. I've not departed from the truths of Scripture. I've not given up the truths of God's Word. I have kept the faith. Now, Paul's motivation for all this was his love for Jesus and his desire to meet him in the clouds of heaven. The decisions that Paul met, made, were made in the light of eternity. The old man is dying now. There are deeply etched lines upon his face. His hair is grayed. His body's racked with pain. The old warrior of the cross has fought many a battle. He's traversed desert sands. He's climbed mountain peaks. He's been ridiculed and mocked in the city. He's been pursued in the country. He's been cast into the sea three days and three nights. The old man's in prison now. The old man is dying. But he writes his final words, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. He's living his life in the light of eternity. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, finally, at the end, finally, at the end, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but those who've loved his appearing. Finally, on that day, Paul says, at the end of life, at the end of life, I will, I will look forward to Jesus and his soon return. He says, I've kept the faith no matter what circumstance I've faced. We too live lives in the light of eternity. With the joy of Christ's love and grace filling our hearts and eagerly anticipating the return of our Lord, I'm reminded of an old Adventist hymn written by a young woman when she was 27, 28 years old, Annie Smith. She wrote it in 1852. I think its words are, are very significant for us today. Here's, here's, she talks about being a pilgrim, and she says, while pilgrims here, we join in this dark veil of sin and gloom through tribulation, hate, and scorn, or through the portals of the tomb till our returning king shall come to take his exiled captives home. Oh, what can buoy the spirits up? What can buoy the spirits up? Tis this alone, the blessed hope, the challenges of life, the trials of life, the problems of life, fade into insignificance in the light of eternity. In your challenges, in your trials, in the problems of life, like the Apostle Paul, keep your eyes focused on the blessed hope. This world is not all there is. There's an eternity. Now, Paul speaks some personal words. He's concerned. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul speaks some very personal words. He's given his theological treaties, but he has some personal needs. He talks about the fact that his life has been poured out as a drink offering. He's given his life as service. He talks about the fact that the time of his departure is at hand. He's ready to leave this life for eternity. He talks about the fact that he's fought the good fight. He's finished he's the race. He's kept the faith. But now he opens his heart. He talks to his young son in the faith, Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. He says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Be diligent to come quickly. Paul is in a prison in Rome. Timothy is in Ephesus, over 800 miles away. 
It's someplace between 64 and 66 AD. Paul has gone through his second trial. Nero has pronounced the death penalty upon him. Nero has claimed that the Christians have burned, are responsible for the burning of Rome. Nero wants to get rid of Paul quickly. Paul is in the Mamertine prison. I remember entering the Mamertine prison some time ago. You go down these narrow stairs, and there you see the stone floor, which you think you're standing on the floor of the prison, but you're not. You're standing really at the roof. And in the middle of that stone, there is a grate. And you look through the grate down into the deep shaft, which is the prison. It's dark. It's damp. It's dirty. And you look down there at this dark, damp prison with absolutely no light except the little hole in, the, in, in that ceiling there. And you think about the fact that the Apostle Paul was imprisoned there. He's gone through his second trial. He's in the dungeon in Rome. As we said, Timothy's in, in Ephesus. But Paul wants to see his young friend again. He longs to have a friend with him. And so he sends Tychicus with this letter to Timothy. He is afraid, though. He's afraid that Timothy may not be able to get there on time. He knows that within a few weeks and at most months, he'll be executed. Now, if the winds are favorable, Tychicus can get back with the letter maybe in two weeks, but likely not. It's a problem. Because to find a boat going from Rome to Ephesus is difficult. So usually you have a stop. So that's going to lengthen the time, maybe three weeks, maybe four. Then you've got to find Timothy. He's got to disengage himself from his responsibilities, and he's got to come back. But there's another problem. Coming back, you face headwinds. Facing the headwinds coming back is going to be at least a couple months. So from the time Paul writes his letter, the best case scenario is Timothy gets back there in three months. And Paul is afraid. He's afraid that he will die before Timothy gets there. So he writes, verse 9, 10, and 11, 2 Timothy 4, Be diligent to come quickly. Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world, Demas had been one of the, the compatriots of Paul, but now he forsakes him and has departed for Thessalon Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. You see, it's one thing to have a friend when everything is going well in your life. But when you're a condemned man, when you are a person who is considered to be an outlaw of society, I wonder what Demas was thinking. Demas was thinking, I, be I better get out of here. I better not be with Paul too much now because uh, they may persecute me. They may see me as one of his, his followers. In Paul's trials, there were those like, like Demas that forsook him. They didn't want to run the risk of being ridiculed. They didn't want to run the risk of being mocked or beaten or imprisoned for their association with a man condemned to death. They fled rather than risk their lives. But Luke stayed with him. It's a wonderful thing, you know what? To have friends that stick with you. It's a wonderful thing that they stick with you no matter what you're going through. Those that are with you when you need them. It's often difficult to go through life challenges alone. We all need the support of godly, praying, encouraging friends that will step in and give us that help and support when we need it. What do you say? Now, you know, it says Luke stayed with him. What do you know about Luke? Did Luke write any other books in the Bible? What did he write? Wrote the book of Acts and also the book of what? Luke. What was Luke's profession? He was a physician. Now, in Roman law, 
nobody could stay with a prisoner except a slave. Roman law allowed two slaves to stay with a prisoner. So what does Luke do? Luke signs on to the journey as Paul's slave. He has no arrogance about his position. He has no self-inflated importance about who he is. He has no pride. He signs on to help his friend wherever his friend needs his help. He's allowed to come into that dark, filthy dungeon. He's allowed to wash Paul's feet if necessary. He's allowed to bring him a few morsels of food. What a friend he is. You know, I read an anonymous statement. It said this, true friends aren't the ones who make your problems disappear. They're the ones who won't disappear when you're facing problems. Shakespeare put it this way, a friend is one that knows you as you are, understands where you've been, accepts what you have become, and still gently allows you to grow. Steve Marr said, friends are, are medicine for a wounded heart and vitamins for a hopeful soul. There's a Jewish proverb that says, who finds a faithful friend finds a treasure. Do you have a faithful friend? But I think there's more important statement. Are you a faithful friend? Are you a faithful friend? Do you have eyes to see the needs of others in the church that may be going through pain, that may be going through suffering, that may be experiencing some heartache? Paul says, only Luke is with me. The others have forsaken me. But he is there. He is there to encourage me. But Timothy, come. The apostle Paul longed for Timothy, his friend, to come. You know, there's an unknown statement that says this. There are friends and there is family. And then there are friends who become family. There are friends and there's family. Then there are friends that become family family. Friends buoy our spirits. Friends encourage our hearts. Paul needed the encouragement of his friends at the time of the greatest trial in his life, and we all need that encouragement. Then the apostle Paul gives Timothy some practical encouragement. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Paul's writing to Timothy. He says, Tychicus, go and tell Timothy to come quickly. But then he says, I got some practical encouragement. Verse 13, 2 Timothy 4. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. In the books, especially the parchments. Bring the cloak. Uh, bring my, my, my cloak. That, that cloak that is dusty from my travels to, to Philippi and to Thessalonica and, 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 and Athens and Corinth. Uh, bring my cloak, my, my cloak that's salty with the brine of the sea breezes from my travels in the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, bring my cloak, my cloak that's blood-stained from the beatings. Bring my cloak that I preached in so many times. Bring my cloak and wrap it around me in prison because I want to think back over my ministry. I want to think back of how, you how God blessed me. Bring my cloak. It's been with me in all my travels and I'm cold. I'm shivering. Bring my cloak. Here we see Paul in all his humanness. See, sometimes what people need is not a sermon, but a friend to provide a cloak, a friend to provide a warm meal, a friend to provide a ride to the doctor's appointment, a, a friend to cut their grass, a, a, some practical help that'll get them through the day. That's all they need. Oh, God, help me to be that friend. Oh, God, help you to be that friend. Paul says, bring my cloak. Then he says, bring my books and the parchments. Bring my books and the parchment. You know what the word for books there is? Biblia. 
What, do we, what, what word do we get from that? Biblia. My Bible. What is he saying here? He's saying, bring the book. Evidently, Paul desired, more than anything else, the scrolls of the Old Testament. He was dying, and he needed something to hang on to. A dying man has little to cling to except the wonderful promises of the Word of God. Paul may have pondered Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. He may have meditated on Psalm 46. The Lord is our refuge and strength. He may have claimed the promise in Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I'll strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. Paul wanted encouragement. And he knew that in the last moments of his life, that which would give him encouragement were the promises of the living word of God. They would sustain him in his time of trial, and they will sustain us in the times of our trial. There's something about the promises of God's word that lifts you above the trials of life, that lifts you above the difficulties of life. There's something about the trials of God's word that enables you to live, rather, the promises of God's word. There's something about the promises of God's word in the time of trial that lifts you above the trial and enables you to live in the light of eternity. The word of God speaks encouragement to our hearts. It speaks hope to our souls. It lifts us from what is to what will be. It focuses us on eternity. When the fog and the miasma of life surrounds us, the promises of God's word clear the fog away so that we can see clearly in the light of eternity the reality that there's something more than the here and the now. Paul comes to the end of 2 Timothy 4. He comes to the very end of that passage and gives to us some of the most meaningful words I believe in all the Bible. Words that can easily be overlooked. He says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 21. He's writing to Timothy. And he says, do your utmost to come before winter. Timothy, come before winter. Why before winter? If Timothy waited until winter was over, it'd be too late. During the winter, the storms blow with their breezes in fury across the Mediterranean. In the winter, the waves lash the boats, lash the sea high. In the winter, in those days, you could not travel on the Mediterranean. Paul, come before winter. Come before winter. Paul, if you wait till after winter, I will be gone. If you wait till after winter, my life is going to be over. Come before winter. Let's suppose, let's suppose that Timothy was unable to come. There is no evidence in the Bible that Timothy ever was able to make it. In the corollary reading of Acts of the Apostles, which I looked at carefully, says that Paul was executed quite quickly and that it would take months to get there. Let's assume Timothy may have come, but I think the evidence is he didn't. But that's not my major point. Let's suppose Timothy is unable to come to Paul soon. Let's suppose he goes to the port and it's winter, and the captain says, there are no boats sailing, you must wait to spring. Paul waits, and he waits, and Timothy does not come. Every time Paul hears footsteps outside the cell on those cobblestone pavement, he says, are those Timothy's footprints? Every time the guard turns the key in the cell door, is this Timothy? Every time he hears a voice, is this Timothy's voice? Every time he hears rumbling outside the prison, 
And people approaching you wonder, is this Timothy, my son in the faith, coming? But in vain, Timothy cannot make it on time. There is no record that Timothy ever got there. He may have, but the distance was so long, travel was so difficult, the journey so arduous, it would have taken a miracle. But yet, Paul's words echo in our minds today. Timothy, come. Come before winter. Come before it's too late. Come before I take my last breath. Come before the sun glances off the educationer's blade and my neck is severed, my head is severed. Timothy, come. There are some things that you must do now or else it's too late. There are some things you must do now or you never can do them. There are some things that if you fail to do now, it's going to be too late. If the Holy Spirit convicts you to give up your life, to give your life to Christ, do it now. Come before winter. Come before the snows fall. Come before the coldness of winter because your heart may be as cold as winter. If you know you ought to make, move ahead and make a commitment for Christ, make that decision now. If you know you need to make right things right with somebody else, do it now. If there's a phone call you need to make, if there's a letter you need to write, if there's a visit you need to do, come before winter. Do it now. Don't live a life of regret of what you once wish you could have done and did not do it. If you need to change directions in your life, do it now. The words of Paul echo down the ages of time. Come, come, come before winter. Act now before it's too late. Tomorrow, the impressions of the Holy Spirit that are so strong today in your life to do that thing may be gone tomorrow. Tomorrow, circumstances may change. Tomorrow, the heart that's so soft today may be hard. Tomorrow, the voice of conscience so strong today may be over. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. What decision is God leading you to make today? What impressions is the Holy Spirit making in your life today? What conviction is God giving you today? Is there some sin in your life that the Spirit is convicting you to give up? Is there some broken relationship that God's appealing to you to have healed? Is there some decision for Christ, maybe baptism, maybe some other decision that God's leading you to make? The words of an old man in a prison in Rome 2,000 years ago come echoing down the corridors of time and they speak to us at this time in this place. Come. Come before winter. Because when the cold winter winds blow, it may be too late. Today is the day of salvation. Choose you this day who you will serve. Let us pray together. Is there somebody today that God is calling to make some decision. I don't know what that decision is, but you feel the stirring in your heart. You feel the moving in your conscience. You feel the impression that you ought to do something. And you hear the words of Paul. You want to live in the light of eternity. Come before winter. This is the day of salvation. And in response to Christ, 
Would you just want to raise your hand and say, Lord, by your grace and through your power, the thing that you are laying on my heart, the thing you are convicting me of, by your grace I will do. Raise your hand just now. God's speaking to you. I don't know what is in your heart, but God does. And when you raise your hand with an act of the will, guided by the Holy Spirit to make a decision to do the thing God puts in your heart, he will give you the strength to do it. He will enable you to carry out your choice. Oh, my Father, thank you for eternal decisions that are made today. We hear the voice of Paul. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give not to me only, but those that love your appearing. Lord, we long for that day that you will come. But until that day, keep us faithful to you and help us live our lives in the light of eternity. In Christ's name, amen.